Uh, I'm happy to have been invited. Uh, today I want to talk about leaping forward and finding the future of your API documentation. Um, as it was mentioned, this is actually my first time in Amsterdam, and it was a bit of an adventure to get here. I just thought I'd share my fun little story. Uh, Mid flight over Canada, I came from San Francisco. My flight had an emergency descent. Um, if you've ever seen the movies, the mask. <laughs> Movies make this moment way scarier than it actually is, let me tell you. Um, but, but that is a, a, a look of pure concern in my eyes right there. <laughs> but uh, got better, it all worked out. I spent an evening in Bangor, Maine. I don't know. Um, but I got here only 21 hours late, so it's all good. Um, but today I want to talk about sort of leaping forward. Um, how many people here uh, work on documentation that they did not originate, as in they came in midstream to existing documentation that they continue to maintain? Cool. And how many people, uh, of everyone, um, wish that they had a better tool to write documentation? Cool. So, when I think about documentation, you know, I think about both the reading experience and the writing experience. And I think having a good writing experience uh, almost always leads to a better reader experience and a better developer experience uh, when you're dealing with API documentation. Um, and I like to think about the tools that we use to write documentation as like a machine or like a car. Um, with a car, you know, uh, it really you know, changes things for you. All of a sudden, instead of just walking or taking transit, you can drive wherever you want. Um, it's expensive, you've got to find something that fits in your price range, it has to have the features that you need, maybe there's some safety equipment that you want to use. Um, but then when you find the one that you like, you have this new car, and it has this big impact on your life, and now maybe you can be more productive or whatever. Um, but over time, much like a car, much like documentation tools, uh, they become less inefficient, and the tool that you thought worked really well when you started um, might not be working uh, as well today. Um, as your needs change, as your product grows, as your audience grows, um, you really want to be uh, as forward-thinking as you can about your tools. Uh, so I have this little graph here that I just want to share. Um, on the bottom is time, and on the left is, is platform complexity. And I'm, I'm really trying to map out the required documentation that you'll need. And you'll notice it always goes up. I've never worked anywhere where they said, Aaron, next year we think we're going to need less documentation. <laughs> Maybe one day, but I don't think soon. Um, but what happens is, over time, the tools that you thought worked really well at the beginning uh, begin to work less well, and eventually you don't have enough productivity to create the documentation that you need. Uh, I think one instinctual reaction to this is, well, you need more writers. Uh, but really what happens is you're just kind of delaying the inevitable. You might get a little more productivity early on, but eventually, the tool is going to affect everyone the same way. If, if you're having tool troubles, everyone on the team is having tool troubles. It could also be a process, it could be anything, but it's, it's going to affect everyone the same. Um, and so the end result is that the actual documentation that you need uh, doesn't meet the level of required documentation that your API users need to be successful on your platform. So like I said, my name is Aaron Verber. I'm Product Manager for Developer Relations at Marketo. Uh, we're based in Oakland, California. Uh, we also have an office in London. Marketa is a payments API infrastructure platform for issuing and processing uh, transactions. We issue uh, debit cards, credit cards, prepaid cards on demand for businesses. We work with companies like Affirm, Square, Instacart to power on demand payments, uh, cards with special controls. And all of this is managed through an open API. Um, and so we have a very high invested interest in producing really good documentation. And recently we rebuilt our documentation site from the ground up, both the front end and the back end. Um, and it's been a really long project. It took us probably 18 months to 24 months from inception to actual execution. Um, I'm going to try and kind of squeeze that into a 30 minute presentation, so I apologize if it's a bit of a whirlwind, um, but here we go. And what I want at the end is to leave you with a toolkit for how you can leap forward with your own documentation. 
So, to start off, a little bit of history. In 2016, Marquette became the first issue processor to publicly document our API. Before this, traditional payments companies uh, were pretty secretive with their documentation, and just to read it, you would be paying a price with many zeros at the end. Um, and that was just to look at the documentation. That's not a sandbox, that's not playing with the actual platform or testing anything out, that's just to read the documentation. Um, and so this was sort of uh, our big sort of disruption of like, we're gonna put our documentation out there. We really are serious about helping startups and businesses innovate with our platform. Um, they need to know how to use it, and they want to know how to use it before they pay for it. Um, so it's one of those things that seems obvious in hindsight, but was fairly uh, revolutionary at the time. So this was our documentation site in 2016. You haven't lived until you've tried to read documentation on a purple gradient. Uh, I don't know, I think it looks okay, but uh, it was pretty hard to read. Um, but anyways, we had one writer back then. We were using a marketing CMS. This was really a tool that was built for blogging, um, but it was something that we were able to leverage uh, quickly to build documentation. Uh, it was pretty straightforward back then. We really only had one uh, sort of set of documentation, some API reference, basically. Um, and then in 2018, uh, we now have four writers at that time working in the same CMS, and it's becoming very quickly apparent that this tool is not built for four people to be writing together all the time. Um, when you're updating a marketing site, you're only doing that you know, fairly infrequently, whereas documentation updates are coming every day sometimes. Um, and so we're starting to really expose some, some pain points. Uh, and then in 2019, uh, this is the new documentation site that we just released for desktop, for mobile. Uh, it's much faster, it's much easier to read. Um, and what's really revolutionary is the new backend, which is built on a static site uh, tool. Um, but what I want to convey with what I've been sort of telling the story so far is that I wasn't there at the beginning. I wasn't there in 2016. I didn't join Marketo until later in 2017. Um, but it was really important for me to take some time and to ask around and to learn the history of our own documentation. Um, this is gonna help provide a lot of context for where it started, what the original goals and the purpose was, um, and it's gonna help you later on um, when you're trying to make this big change. So ask who wrote the original docs, ask who built or configured the original tool, who set it up, uh, where are they now? Uh, keep a record of the docs history. We actually have a slideshow that we keep um, we take snapshots of a couple different pages every couple months, and it's great um, for us both just as a, as a tool to sort of review where we've been, but it's also really easy to demonstrate the sort of added value that we've been delivering over months and years. And if you haven't been doing this, it's really easy to get started. Archive.org has a history of a lot of websites that used to be called the Wayback Machine, um, but you can go in there, type in the URL of your site, and it goes back pretty far, it's pretty extensive. So. Now that we know the history, it's time to start looking at the signs of trouble. This is how you know, hey, maybe it's time that we need to make a change. And one of the very first things that stood out as a, as a, a looming issue for us was the 2020 product roadmap. Uh, in the time that I've been at Marketo, we've grown from 100 people to 300 people. We've expanded to uh, deliver our products in regions around the world, including many countries in Europe now. Um, and so if what the documentation that we needed to deliver was this giant yard of cargo containers, then this was the 2016 <laughs> documentation pipeline. Uh, it just wasn't going to happen. Like In terms of actual minutes it would take to do, it just wasn't going to fit. Um, so we needed a better tool. And so we started asking ourselves, we started noticing things that were going on in our team, in our processes, in our tool, uh, and we started sort of looking for warning signs. And so these are sort of some of the things that I think anyone can look at as uh, sort of red flags and saying like, hey, maybe it's time to do something about this. So. Do you create fragile processes to cover tool gaps? One of the things that our tool didn't allow for was collaboration or version control. So you're basically spending every moment of your life worrying that you're gonna overwrite someone else's work at any minute. Um, especially because uh, you know, some of our writers are remote, we're not always in communication every minute of every day, we don't know what everyone's working on. Um, and so we ended up creating these spreadsheets and Google spreadsheets and 
tracking different dates of who needs what document when, and it's and it's incredibly unproductive. It's you know you're adding work uh, that you shouldn't need uh, to have just to get your job done every day. Um, do you worry about overwriting unpublished work? Like I just said, there was no version control. Um, there was multiple times where we inadvertently overwrote someone else's work, and it was fairly easy to fix. Uh, but this isn't a great experience. You, should, you shouldn't be worrying about publishing documentation changes. You should just be able to publish them and, and keep moving forward. Do you avoid certain docs because the tool is too difficult? Uh, this is one thing, this is a really weird, I don't know, anomaly of our doc tool was the sections, like if you think of a header and a paragraph, were hard-coded so that a certain type of page had seven sections and another type of page had 21 sections. And you couldn't switch the sections after the page was started. And if you wanted to move the sections around, you had to literally control X the text out of that block, put it somewhere else, move the one block back, grab the next block, move that back, and then eventually you could paste the content back in at the end. I spent a long time doing this for a long time, and I, I don't want to do it ever again. And so uh, that's, that's one thing to watch out for. Um, and finally, do you prefer writing your docs outside of your doc tool? Uh, I see this as a bad sign. I know some people have very specific preferences about the tool that they use to, especially for early drafts and things like that. But I think the more work that you can do inside the tool that you chose, the better. Uh, and so we definitely wanted to move in that direction. So watch for signs of trouble, avoid bad processes, avoid working outside your tool. Uh, one thing you can do is track these unintended or undesirable outcomes. Uh, you can use a scoring system and saying like every time someone comes and asks you to do something that you can't do or it's too difficult, write it down, give it a score, and see what you, what's happening. What are the sort of uh, friction points that are coming up every month? And also survey writer satisfaction. This is something we, we did once we once we started talking about switching to a new tool was, okay, how are we going to measure the impact? Well, each month we sent out a survey, we asked sort of basic questions about like what what's your biggest pain point? What's the best part about this tool? What's the worst part about this tool? Uh, what's your overall satisfaction? And we were able to track that over months and, and see an improvement once we reached uh, the new tool. So, speaking of pain points, don't laugh. This is a perfectly good Star Trek movie. <laughs> so, some of the pain points that I already discussed, already discussed were no collaboration, no version control, no review tools, limited page size, limited organization options. I want to go into the organization uh, limitations very quickly. Uh, this is a graphic we put together to sort of show how we build competency for our users. Uh, your users generally start in the lower left. They don't know a lot about payments. They don't know a lot about how your platform works. Um, and what you need to do is you need to move them to the upper right. This is where your, op your, your users really thrive and can be successful. Uh, but it can't be done with any one tool. There are lots of different ways to learn out there. Reading, listening, watching, doing. Uh, and you really want to be able to provide for all of those things. Uh, and so if you, if you look, you can see API reference helps very much in the technical competency zone, but it only barely pushes you over the edge in terms of what you need to know about payments. So we started writing developer guides. Um, but originally the tool didn't support this. We actually had to spend some developer time on our old tool just to allow having multiple collections of documentation, different types of documentation. Uh, and so over time, you know, we've added these different uh, tools uh, to help sort of fill out uh, the ways that people can learn about our platform. Um, but it's been really difficult, and it's been too difficult, and, and writers need, really need the runway uh, to be able to create these resources um, without stopping for developer resources every time you want to add a new, uh, new type of documentation. So solving pain points isn't enough to leap forward, though. You know, fixing my problems, a user isn't going to care if the writer had a better experience. They might end up with better documentation, but if you're going to stop and spend all this time in revamping your documentation tool, uh, you're going to have to show where the added value comes from. And so this is where you want to get a little aspirational. This is where you want to uh, start defining things that you think you can uh, achieve to deliver uh, better documentation. And so we want a better offering, uh, simple. We want the docs to be closer to the code. This would help things like um, reviews with our developers. 
We wanted to prepare for more automated tools, uh, things like uh, Swagger specs, Open API specs, and, the, and things you can do with that to build dynamic documentation. We wanted to keep the source portable. This is going to help us the next time we want to make a leap uh, because we'll be able to move the documentation more easily. And we wanted something that had an existing ecosystem that we could capitalize on rather than building everything custom ourselves. So, remember to go beyond pain points. What could you do with a new tool? Create a shared taxonomy. This is actually something that was really helpful for us when we were doing our new tool is when you're talking to designers, when you're talking to developers, or even product people, they don't always know what it is you do every day as a technical writer. They don't know what you mean when you say the sidebar, or the menu bar, or a heading, or an annotation. And so defining these things and sharing that document is really helpful uh, to keep steady progress. Also, most critically, I think, is demonstrating that added value ahead of time by building the prototype. So let's talk about building prototypes. In the end, we chose to build our new documentation tool in Gatsby and ASCII doc. And I'm going to get a little bit into the specifics of why in a moment. Uh, but more importantly, it wasn't the first thing that we tried to do. We got there eventually. Um, we had a bunch of different stops along the road to get there. In 2017, we did a quick hack week prototype where we actually built dynamic documentation generated via a Swagger spec. It was really cool. It looked really great. I wish I had a picture of it. Uh, but we realized pretty quickly that this was maybe a leap too far forward. This was going to take too much uh, buy-in from across the organization to change how some of our APIs worked. And so it was a little too much to start. And so we kind of uh, rethought what we were going to do from there. Um, and so this is actually one of the final prototypes that we built using ASCII doc and Hugo. Um, before we switched to Gatsby, we were using Hugo because that was a slightly easier thing for me to develop with. I'm not a developer, but uh, static site generators like Gatsby and Hugo are, are pretty easy to use tools, and there are a lot of ways to get started with them. Um, but this was based on some uh, wireframes from the designer. As they were developing the plans for uh, what they wanted to do, I would be make, making changes to the prototype to make sure that everything that I was saying this tool was going to do was actually feasible. So, a little bit about ASCII doc. This is what we chose, um, but I think you can, you know, obviously there are a lot of different tools out there, um, but it's possibility space. Uh, ASCII doc is the canvas on which you can do pretty much anything you want. Um, but there are sort of five specific points that we, we picked it for. Number one, humans can read the source. This is what our documentation source files used to look like. It's a JSON object. Every paragraph gets its own sub-object. If something is highlighted bold, it gets its own sub-object in that sub-object. I, I don't even know what to say. I can't even do this. <laughs> this is what it looks like now. This is that same content in ASCII doc. And it's incredibly powerful because even if I didn't have something rendering this, anyone can read this and know what it means. Number two. There's a healthy ecosystem. Like we talked about, we wanted things that we could quickly plug into uh, to move forward. So things like Gatsby, like I said, static site generators make using ASCII doc really straightforward. Jekyll, Hugo, and Tora is specifically designed to work with ASCII doc. GitHub, obviously, uh, GitHub renders ASCII doc natively, like we talked about in the last talk. The readme file can be written in ASCII doc and it looks great. Um, Visual Studio Code has a ton of plugins for working with ASCII doc, but again, these are just some of the tools that you can use. You can mix and match in any way that you want. Number three, it can live near your code. It can also not live near your code if that's a choice. Right now, we have our documentation living in the same repo as the rest of our public-facing websites, but we could just as easily have put it with our API production code and taken that content um, from multiple repositories and build the same documentation site. Number four, and this is one of the most critically important things for, for my interest, is it's convertible and portable. So ASCII doc uh, is based on docbook XML, and so it's a semantic language, but it also means that it converts really easily into a lot of different uh, file formats. These are just some of them. Uh, once you convert it into XML, you can basically convert it into anything that you want. Uh, but this is really handy and really helps with future proofing. Mm -hmm. And then number five, it's free, it's open source, and you own your content. Um, one thing that we as an enterprise 
uh, had, to, had to think about was the sort of EULAs and license agreements that you come into contact with some of these uh, existing CMSs and things out there where they'll say, hey, you own your content, but we get to license whatever we want for marketing, etc. That's not going to fly at every organization, and so it's something to keep in mind. So, build your own prototype. This was something that the technical writers took on for themselves. It was a really powerful learning experience. Uh, this helps you limit risk and show value early. It gives yourself time to find and reject the wrong tools. We actually went through a bunch of different tools in between what I showed off. We looked at traditional XML tools. We looked at some more advanced CMS tools. Um, but it really was a matter of taking the time. Keep in mind any third-party content policies, like I said. And if you're interested in things like ASCII doc or static site generators, Stackbit and Netlify are two really great tools for rapidly building sites, prototyping, iterating, and seeing results. So, if you're going to adopt a new tool, you need to make sure your writers know how to use it. What's great is that when you're switching to a new tool, there's usually a time between the time that you start building it and when it's finished. This is the perfect time to do some practice. One of the first things you can do is document your new tool using your new tool. So this is ASCII doc in GitHub. This is the GitHub repo of our documentation. In there, we keep an ASCII doc file. It's got all the instructions of how to use uh, the repo, how to make changes, some of these sort of style standards that we'd settled on, uh, and so on. Another one is we set up a dedicated Slack channel so that the writers could come in and ask questions, especially early on when you're trying to set up some of the dependencies, install some of the software. Uh, it can be really great to just quickly come in and say, hey, I've got a question, help me out, uh, and move forward. We also did sort of a hands-on work exercise where we basically created demo tasks. And we all met in a meeting room and we said, okay, if one of the big problems is collaboration and uh, working together at the same time, let's prove it by completing all of these five tasks uh, over the top of each other and see what we end up with at the end. And this was a really valuable exercise to make sure that everything that we were promising uh, we could still do. So, use the migration time to practice. You're going to have to move all of that documentation out of the old format into the new format. It gives you plenty of time to learn the new method. Uh, document your tool using your tool. Use a dedicated Slack channel. Uh, test that new publishing process. And this is also a perfect time to run internal user testing. Um, we had all sorts of you know, great ideas, and we had things that we thought, oh, they're going to see this, and they're going to think that. And actually, the number one feedback that we got in user testing had nothing to do with the documentation at all. It was that in the very first guide, it asked you to get your API keys, and we didn't tell anyone where they were. And it's like, OK, great. Everything else seems fine then. Uh, and then finally, the future. This is looking forward to that next leap forward that you're going to make. This is a great movie, by the way. Um, so, as I mentioned before, we started with Content Management System. It was easy to start, that's why we chose it at the very beginning. But it's vendor-based, so it costs a lot of money, and it's monolithic, it's difficult to develop on. We couldn't really expand the documentation the way we wanted to. So we switched to this ASCII doc-based tool chain with Gatsby and ASCII doc and GitHub, and we built it using Drone. Um, and this has really elevated uh, the experience that we're able to develop, deliver to our developers. Um, but we're always planning ahead. You always have to keep the next step in mind. Um, and so we're thinking about how we're going to move on to you know, this API spec, API spec based tool chain using something like OpenAPI, how we combine it with ASCII doc. You know, we're still using that same content management system for marketing. We're going to keep the ASCII doc based documentation for guides. Now let's elevate our API reference. Um, by automating and generating from the production code, building dynamic code samples, building postman collections dynamically. Um, and so again, like right now I'm thinking about this, it's like, I don't know how I'm going to get there, but um, it's, it's really great to, to keep forward and always have that next step in mind. Also be thoughtful about the long-term writing experience and information architecture. The more you develop with the cool tool of today, uh, the, the more you dig in on that, the less you're going to be able to jump on the next tool that comes down the line. So you really want to stay agile, uh, stay flexible, um, and you'll really be able to benefit long term. So, plan for the future, choose tools that can grow and adapt with you, don't overinvest, 
building phases towards your goal. This was really valuable for us with the prototype, moving to a beta, things like that. And always be dreaming up the next big improvement. You might not be able to do it today, but you want to be ready for when you can do it tomorrow. So, the whole toolkit, knowing the history, track the signs of pain points, go beyond pain points to show added value, build your own prototype, use the transition to practice, and plan for the future to make your next leap easier and even greater. If you want to check out our new documentation site, it's at marketo.com slash docs, works great on mobile. Uh, and also, I just want to say, none of anything that I talked about is possible without a big group of dedicated, talented, motivated people. Um, everyone in this picture contributed in some way to making the documentation, the new documentation site possible. Um, and they're the only reason that I can be here today to share the things that we learned um, working on it. So, thank you very much. Find me on Twitter.